more abstract nonlinear features can input. And I can do that several times and extract even more abstract features. And now I have learned a higher level representation that I, and I can plug that in uh, a deep supervised neural net to do classification or something like that. So that's a standard way that uh, they have been used. Now, there is one interesting question uh, that we've been asking ourselves. Why is this working at all? And uh, we've explored a number of hypotheses and standard things in machine learning is to ask the question, is this uh, an issue of regularization or is this an issue of optimization? So the regularization hypothesis was that I mentioned before that the presentations that are good for modeling the input distribution are in part good also for modeling our supervised problem. Uh, and we've done experiments that clearly confirm that. Now, regarding the optimization hypothesis, our initial hypothesis was that, well, because of local minima, the uh, unsupervised pre-training puts you near a better local minimum. And so when you do gradient descent from that initial point, you find a better solution. It turns out that it's not a better local minimum of training error, which was our initial hypothesis. It's actually a better local minimum of generalization error. And that's sort of better and sort of stranger, but is what's happening. Uh, now let me explain this nice picture. So what we've done to understand a bit more uh, what's going on is look at the trajectory of learning. So what is happening during training? Um, each of these points here represents a, a neural net at different points during training. The color represents the number of iterations. Uh, they all start blue and then they go towards green. And there are two groups of networks, uh, those without unsupervised pre-training and those with unsupervised pre-training. So this is like the standard neural nets, and these are the ones which use unsupervised learning. Um, and there are like uh, several hundred nets that are initialized out here, and uh, you can follow the trajectory of, of one of them. So the state that we're applying here is a 2D representation of the function uh, represented by the neural net using some dimensional theory reduction method. And what we find is that each different initialization ends up in a different local minimum, which, which really tells us that the number of local minima is huge. And here, if we zoom, we also see uh, that they all go to different local minima, but they're all kind of close to each other, so that's better. Uh, there's less variance between these guys and between these guys, which explains uh, in part why this is not even better. And the other really important point is that uh, random initialization without using our trick of unsupervised pre-training has almost zero chance of finding the kind of functions you would get here using unsupervised pre-training. It's not like that these ones are some special case of these. They are completely in another region of, of space. So you, you really are looking for a needle in a haystack unless you have the right initialization somehow. Okay. I have one last question. Yes. Uh, why are there two Can you put the previous slide on, please? <laughs> this one. So from this one, I have the impression that after the pre-training, you, uh, you have all the initializations in a very restricted space. Is it some effect of the regularization you put in that makes it's that? Just, no, okay, so just, uh, it's just because what we're plotting here is after the first iteration. And so we're not plotting the initial function before we start trying. Because otherwise, I, I guess, we, I mean, we would see, uh, I don't know where they would be. But, uh, uh, so the fact is, after one epoch, one iteration of training, all of the networks kind of do the same thing. They do something stupid, which is uh, predicting the average value, like the class probabilities. And so, so they, that's why they all start kind of here. Is that answering your question? Yeah, what I was getting at was trying to understand if the pre-training somehow has better chances to converge to a single optimum for the feature representation well, or to close. They are all different, but they are much closer to each other. Yeah, which is okay. So we have other graphs showing that they are all also different. All right. 
Hello everybody and uh, congratulations. I think you made it through the hard part of the tutorial of all the theory and the basics and the notation. Uh, from now on, we'll focus more and more on applications and sort of uh, some fun visualizations and things like that. Um, before we go into the break, I'll just briefly give you a motivation for sort of two slides of what's coming next in, in part two on recursive neural networks. Uh, so in part one, we described another sort of word vector space model um, that learns word vector representations. Uh, again, these representations are usually like 50 or 100 dimensional, um, but we'll visualize them in 2D. Um, as mentioned before, similar vectors sort of indicate similar syntactic and semantic information in these figures. And so, um, of course, words never appear in isolation. Um, and so one question is, how would we represent uh, longer phrases such as the country of my birth or the place where I was born. Let's say we have a text summarization system and we would like, you know, not include both because they have roughly the same meaning. So the question is that we're answering in this and next upcoming part is how could we rep represent the meaning of longer phrases? And our answer is by mapping them into the same vector space so we can now compare multi-word phrases to single word phrases and to other multi-word phrases. And the main question is, how should we do this? How should we go about mapping phrases into a vector space? And our answer is to use some kind of principle of compositionality, where the meaning vector in our case of a sentence is determined by, one, the meaning of its words, and we learned a cool method of how to learn these word vector representations, and two, the rules that are used to combine them. So if we have here uh, a phrase like my birth, which is a noun phrase, and we combine now these two vectors, we would like the resulting vector that now represents um, this bike on my birth to have, to, you know, look mostly like birth, but maybe have some possessive quality that comes from the possessive determiner my here that we combined. And then, you know, the country is also a noun phrase, we combine that, and of my birth is a prepositional phrase, and the whole phrase in the end will ideally uh, be close to other countries. And so the neat thing about uh, the methods uh, of recursive neural networks um, models based on these is that they can jointly learn these compositional vector representations and the trees that are used to combine them, which kind of makes syntactic sense. Uh, with that, um, I think we'll start to all get a little caffeinated and I'll hold the scenics. Half an hour? Half an hour? Let's say at 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you. 